Hello gang, Professor McElroy here. We're in week two, learning module two of digital illustration class. Uh, happy Valentine's Day. Uh, I'm gonna try to keep the lecture to an hour, hour and a half. Uh, give you plenty of time to kind of play around in Illustrator some more. Keep working on your projects for learning module one and learning module two. Uh, early in the morning, I'm gonna be heading off to New York City to uh, the College Art Association's annual conference. And in essence, this is the association that you, know, you join that kind of guides the art and design curriculum for the thousand plus colleges and universities that offer art and design as a degree track. Uh, so I'll be going up there to take a look at the latest curriculum, see what's going on, see what schools are doing, and just uh, ingesting myself in design uh, as it relates to university instruction. So I'm um, looking forward to that. So next week when I come back, I'll talk to you guys a little bit about some of the stuff that I saw uh, as it relates to digital illustration. But uh, happy Valentine's Day. Like I said, uh, we're going to do a little recording this week. Uh, I'm going to go ahead first and uh, just give me one second. All right, I'm back. I just had to lock the classroom door. So, uh, okay, here we go. Uh, really good job so far on learning module one. Uh, each of your little mini projects inside of your uh, textbook uh, chapter files, uh, you can pick any of the mini chapters in each one, uh, assignments in each one of our chapters. Uh, chapter three probably has six or seven little mini projects. Most students tackle the Frankenstein looking illustration, like chapter two is that little flame tiki guy. Uh, you can choose any of the mini projects to complete, to submit as a PDF for chapter three and or chapter four. Just make sure that you are practicing the, the other mini skills inside of the assignments, inside of the chapters, because it's another opportunity to practice the pen tool, get comfortable with what you're doing uh, and kind of continue. It's kind of like riding a bike. The more that you practice, the better you get. Uh, last week, we spent a lot of time talking about just basically using the pencil, the paintbrush, the pen tool. And we looked a little bit towards the end of the lecture with the Pathfinder tool. So this week, we're going to go a little bit more in depth in some of the more enhanced uh, kind of drawing features. Some of the things I like to do as I start to really fine tune my pen drawings in Illustrator, uh, just show you some of the tricks of the trades that I like and, uh, and see if we can't help to enhance your drawing a little bit. Really good job learning module one with the bird, uh, doing both that loose kind of pencil sketch, filling it in with the paintbrush, and then seeing a more modern interpretation of how the pen tool works and how you kind of shape and draw things a little more, what I would consider finished, but that necessarily isn't the right term because there's lots of organic kind of looser drawings done in Illustrator that you can see across all applications. So you really get an idea for uh, the different techniques of digital illustration. You can go to the food store and just look at packaging design. The organic soaps are a little bit looser illustration style, floral, animals, that sort of thing. And then you get into some of the energy drinks where it's much more modern interpretation of illustration, modern interpretation of drawing. So it uh, gives you kind of the cross spectrum of the different styles. Digital illustration class is all about just developing a style, getting comfortable with creating an illustrator and then seeing where it takes you from there. And like I said, with every class in design I ever teach, uh, there's lots of applications to do drawing in. And so illustrator just happens to be the one that is uh, one of the more popular in our industry because Adobe kind of has the hold on using design software for a final professional output, but it doesn't mean there's not an, a lot of other really good vector-based drawing tools that you can use, whether you have a tablet or your phone or a, a computer or a laptop or whatever it may be. So digital illustration is evolving. So just be aware of that as we're working, it is an evolving thing. So 
uh, let's just keep practicing and trying. And then, you know, you may end up finding an application that you fits your eye a little bit better, that you feel a little more comfortable with. So, and that's okay too. So uh, we're just going to kind of learn the process, start to get a little more comfortable with uh, drawing, and then you can kind of expand upon that based on what you're most comfortable with. I still have some friends that draw on paper and pencil, and they scan it into the computer, and they live trace it, and they still do everything pretty raw. They do it with pen and paper, and that's okay too. There's a style, there's an application for that as well. So it kind of fits into the eye of the visual communicator, and who's most comfortable with what skill set they're comfortable with. So my job is just to Expo expose you to the different types of drawing techniques. And then from there, you can kind of build upon your skill set. So, all right, so let's, uh, let's go in here and I'm going to download the little book cover image that I downloaded because your out of book project for this week uh, is a book cover. So I thought I would just take a very graphic, simple book cover uh, that's currently out there and just talk about the pen tool and how this thing is replicated and like what it looks like and kind of how the artist more than likely drew this thing as it kind of replicated this style. So we'll talk a little bit about how it works and kind of the thought process of how this thing is layered. And we'll use the Pathfinder tool and we'll use uh, the pen tool and smooth it out a little bit and do a bunch of the things we have to do in order to kind of replicate the look and feel of this. This is a very graphic illustration. Uh, last week, we did a very loose kind of uh, organic illustration. So we're just gonna continue upon that application. All right, gang, so here we go into Illustrator and we're gonna get in and do our next series of skill sets, uh, kind of enhancing our drawing ability here. Our out of book is a book illustration. So we'll spend the next hour or so doing a digital drawing and then I'll open it up for lab time for you guys so you can continue to practice a little bit uh, your illustration style. I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna do an eight inch by eight inch uh, cover. I like square things right now, and I don't know if you noticed it, but a lot of magazines and different things like that uh, are now coming out with a more square format. And so we're going to kind of do this format. I know that the book cover that I put in the announcement is not square. That's a more traditional, uh, it looks like 8 by 10 or 8 by 11 format. Uh, but let's go ahead in here. I'm going to go in and place my book cover. I'm going to spend some time just with the pen tool, smoothing the pen tool out, applying effects doing different things uh, with our drawing style so that we can start to get a little more comfortable with some of the different techniques. You guys did a really good job last week with the uh, loose drawing and then the kind of more modern interpretation of the drawing from there. So I'm feeling comfortable based on the submissions. You guys are doing a pretty good job. Uh, I'm actually going to go in and place this 100% because I'm going to I'm going to go in and draw all of my elements kind of separate based on what we have going on here. So I'm just going to drop this in the way it is because we got some different things that we have to create. So for the sake of the process, I'm just going to make my artboard a little bit bigger so it fits just the illustration part of my placed object. And then from there, we can kind of go in and layer type and play around with things. So, all right, so we're in, we're in. So our layers, we're gonna add a new layer. We're gonna lock this layer. Uh, we're gonna zoom in a little bit so we can get an idea of what's going on here. Uh, we've got kind of this mountain scene, uh, this tree, the sun and the sunset. And just like I talked about in week one, the sand is the foreground, the tree, the mountain in the city is the middle ground, and the background is the sun or setting moon, whatever you want to say, and the sky. So we're going to replicate this thing just in the same process that you would do if you were drawing this thing from scratch. So I'm going to name this my image layer. I'm going to name the next layer background, uh, uh, sunset, just so I have the basics here. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is just replicate the sky and the sunset. This is really easy because we're 
drawing background to foreground. So I can actually just draw a big container here and use my eyedropper and sample the background. So there is my sunset. I'm gonna go ahead and do switch the fill to a stroke and remove the fill. That way I can see my moon. And then once I have my sun or moon or whatever you wanna call it drawn, I'm gonna go ahead and make this, use my eyedropper to sample the color. And then I'm just gonna kind of drop it in here. Let me switch it to outline so I can see exactly what's going on. And so let's zoom in here a little bit. And I'm just showing you, we're just replicating what's already here. And I'm just showing the technique of background to middle ground to foreground. So I'm gonna go ahead and expand that, which means I can then toggle switch it over. This is my background layer. So I need to, uh, I'm gonna make the rectangle. Oh, well, the rectangle's fine because it's behind it. So let's click on that and switch it. So now you'll see when I zoom out, I have in essence the, the sun, setting sun or setting moon, whatever you want to call it, the background shape. I've sampled with the eyedropper, the colors, so that I have the basic color match. Now I would take it one step further and I would add each one of these to my swatch library. So I can click on that background color and drag the swatch over and drop it in my swatch library and then drag this one and drop it in. So now I have the two colors from my background already into my swatch library, which is awesome. Uh, so I got my image. Now I have my background. I'm gonna go ahead and hide the background because you can see what it looks like. But when I build background to foreground, I can't see the other elements because I drew the background first. But the reason the background is important to create first is because these elements are overlaying on top of that element. And I wanna be able to see those pieces, but keep the scale and everything appropriately. We're not worrying about Pantone colors per se so much. I'm sampling directly from the colors of the background that I'm copying. But if I was creating this for a publisher, there's one, two, three, four, looks like five colors. I would, I would do swatch colors of those Pantone colors. So just know if I was creating this from scratch, I wouldn't be using the eyedropper to create my elements, but here's a perfect rep, uh, replication of the background. So I have the sky and the yellow moon or the sun or whatever you wanna say that modern thing is. Very simple rectangular shape tool, then the circle tool, placing them in the appropriate. But you will see now that when I put my middle ground in there, it's gonna cover up that moon, but look how perfect it is. I can actually uh, turn off and turn on the, uh, background layer I've created. And you can see that the moon is a full moon once I drew it myself to scale and proportion. And then I have my other elements in front of it. So I'm just gonna hide them for now because I already have them created. So now I gotta move on to my middle ground, which is my tree and my mountains. And just to kind of break this apart for you, the mountain and the tree is all one shape. It is a Pathfinder Unite shape. And the reason that's important is because these kind of wrap to the roots aspect of the tree are Pathfinder subtract shapes. So they are cut out of the tree and the mountainscape. So just as your brain is thinking, you have to think about this thing in shapes. What are these unified shapes that you're creating in a vector world? And when you're not doing a loose drawing, that's really important because your brain should be seeing things in black and white. You should be seeing solid shapes. You should be seeing subtracted shapes. You should see these things in a more uh, black and white, cut and dry, simple foreground, middle ground, and background elements. Now, we're gonna tackle this thing in its layer. So you can see the background layer is done uh, in all of its glory. So now I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna create my middle ground, middle mountain. And I'm just gonna call it middle mountain because that's the main elements inside of my illustration. So now here goes the pen tool aspect, right? But before I start drawing, I'm gonna break you through a few pieces. First off, this trunk is a solid trunk when it was drawn first. These are minus, these are subtracted shapes in the trunk. So when I draw this tree, I'm gonna draw this tree with these shapes closed in. So this little area right here is gonna be closed in. And I'm gonna make this a solid tree because the artist actually subtracted these lines later 
from the illustration to give it the graphic effect that it has. And you'll actually notice that there is an overlap of the mountain scene right here, the little town. When I draw it, I'm gonna bring this line through and I'm gonna finish off this shape. And then I'm gonna subtract the elements I wanna remove. So it's kind of like cut paper. Think about it as cutting the silhouette first and then subtracting the elements from the silhouette. And you may not notice, but I'm actually gonna bring the color down below the sand dunes because remember I'm layering these objects. So I wanna make sure it's a nice crisp, clean illustration that I'm creating. I don't wanna have to follow the, the shape of these dunes twice wants to draw the mountain and then a second time for the dunes. I could put the color behind it. It doesn't matter because that element is technically behind this element in the illustration. So you could see my sun or my moon, my yellow moon in my background. And now I'm creating my middle ground, which is my mountains. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the eyedropper and sample this blue. But remember when I did the sketch, I didn't fill anything in because it's really hard to draw when you're filling things in. Uh, so I'm gonna use my pen tool and I'm gonna to toggle this to the stroke. So I'm gonna remove the fill, toggle it to the stroke. That way I can draw this mountain scene. And that'll help me a lot in my drawing. I'm actually going to zoom in a little bit too, because I can use the space bar to move my document while I'm drawing. And the reason I'm going to do that is because this thing has a nice smooth trunk to it. So I want to make sure that my trunk is smooth. So I'm going to start my pen tool and I'm actually going to start it out underneath the sand dunes. And so you can kind of see how I'm going to shape this thing. And I'm just going to follow along the shape of these sand dunes. And you can see how many points I'm using based on the comfort level of my ability to draw. And I'm gonna just kind of shape this thing a little bit. And you'll notice where it changes direction drastically here. I'm gonna remove the forward anchor and I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna meet it to the top of this curve. But remember, I'm taking this trunk all the way up. I'm gonna take this trunk all the way up because I wanna use the Pathfinder tool to cut out the area of the trunk that I wanna remove. So I'm gonna use my space bar and I'm gonna pan along here. And I'm gonna take my time because a lot of what I'm gonna talk about tonight is effects and things you can do after you have a finished drawing. So I'm gonna take my time as I lecture here and I'm gonna do a decent job of tracing this tree a little bit. I'm giving my own interpretation of the tree, but I at least wanna make sure that I do a decent job kind of tracing this tree. So I'm gonna to touch it to there. And I'm gonna take my curve and bring it to there. And then we'll bring it around. I'm gonna take my time because I wanna make sure I get a decent drawing here. So if you're drawing along with me, take your time and get a decent drawing. I can always zoom in, use my space bar to kind of curve it a little bit. So I'm gonna take my drawing and kind of ease it along. Now I'm gonna show you things like the width tool where I could have created these branches using the width tool and then unified the shape later. There's a bunch of different ways to kind of do a technique for creating shapes in Illustrator. A lot of it just comes down to what you feel comfortable with as a pen tool, because there's lots of different ways to draw, just like there's lots of different ways to manipulate pixels in Photoshop. I mean, there's lots of ways to create different raster-based image solutions. That's why design is such a beautiful thing because everyone does things a little bit differently. So when someone's coming to you looking for something created, they're doing that because they like your style or they like the way you see color or shape or texture. And so there's a whole business out of just creating your own little style as it relates to uh, drawing and just different ways of doing things and illustrator. So I'm just kind of bending this line, kind of creating this organic tree, knowing that my interpretation kind of gives it its own interpretation. You will notice that I'm trying not to remove the forward anchor, even though I'm gonna show you how to smooth out your lines after you create this thing. That is a really good way to do it if you're drawing with the pen tool and your line doesn't feel absolutely perfect. And your book actually highlights it, how you can round off or smooth node points as you're drawing to kind of create the best effect, best style. And I gotta tell you, I've been drawing since 93 in Illustrator, so a long time. 
And my style as an illustrator has changed over the years quite a bit too. As I get more comfortable with technology, more comfortable with how I'm drawing, like how my eye sees the line weight, the pen tool, that sort of thing, my style has changed quite a bit as well. So just know as you practice, you're gonna kind of have your own you know, development of illustration style. And my company's brand has changed quite a bit over the years, keeping in mind that I've had my design business since 94. So it's had a life of its own for quite a number of years now. Uh, even my typography, my identity, how I do things as a visual designer has kind of evolved over the years, uh, just based on a lot of factors, right? I get older, it's kind of like a, a, mu a musician. Their album is totally different when they're 30 versus when they're 20 versus when they're 40. I mean, it's just the nature of the beast. As you mature as a creative thinker, your, uh, your style changes, right? Kind of evolves. And so I'm just taking my time. I'm on my last kind of branch here. Uh, so I make sure I get something that feels a little bit organic and, you know, kind of fits the style of what I'm replicating here. Keeping in mind, if I was drawing this as a book cover, I would probably do something totally different. Like this isn't my style per se, but it's fine for, you know, replicating a book cover. And this is a pretty famous one for as far as 2022 goes. So this book has been sold a lot and this is kind of a pop popular illustration cover. You would probably say it's one of the better of 2022. So it gives you a really good idea of graphic style and what works based on, you know, what your, what your intended audience is. And so I'm just kind of coming down here, trying to finish what I got going on. And this is a really organic thing that this illustrator has going on. I mean, you could use the with tool and create each one of these branches, taper out the end of the branches and create something rather interesting as well. But it's style, right? Style, practice, practice, practice. It's kind of like when you're an illustrator, you gotta draw, 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 right? And illustrators have headhunters, what they call headhunters. So they shop their drawing style out to publishers so that if they need spot illustrations for magazines or they're looking for a drawing for a particular client, maybe it's a commercial or some printed piece, uh, they have a, in essence, a, a style board that they use, that their agent uses to kind of showcase how they do what they do. So I'm gonna go in here and I'm almost there, I'm almost done. I'm just kind of creating this tree shape here. Right. Let me zoom out a little bit because I'm to the mountainside now. And so you'll see as I draw, there's the outline of my tree. You'll notice I did not trace around the shapes in the trunk. I'm gonna make that one solid piece and then I'm gonna cut those shapes out of the trunk. And I'm gonna show you how to do that. It's part of that Pathfinder subtract tool. Uh, I'm gonna go in though, and I'm going to create my finished shape. So I'm gonna close the shape out and you're gonna notice I'm going under the surface area of the dunes, right? I'm going under the surface area of the dunes. So you can see my shape right there. And the reason I'm doing that is because I don't wanna double trace those dunes, right? I don't wanna double trace those dunes. I wanna be able to draw the dunes in my foreground layer and just go right over the top of the underliningness of that mountain. And I'm gonna go in and draw my last little piece here. So I've got this little tip of the mountain. And this is practice as you follow along, more or less you're practicing with me so that you can really get the best out of your pen tool as you're creating. And so I've got my mountains basically cut out here. Now I've got a couple of things I gotta tackle, right? The person in the dunes is the foreground. The tree, the mountains, and the city are the middle ground. And the moon and the sky is the, 
background. So if I go in here and I just toggle this so you can see the full shape and I turn on my background layer. So that's what it looks like so far, right? So it looks like what I'm trying to recreate, but I've got overlap issues. I can actually see part of the sunset or the yellow moon under my tree drawing. I've only got part of my mountainside here, right? I, the dunes aren't even there yet. I haven't added the leaves. I'm just showing you the structure of this thing because we're gonna have to kind of build this thing in background, middle ground and foreground and work the way that I'm kind of describing where we're building solid, overlaying solid and then subtracting elements as we need to subtract them. And this is, is a bit of a modern interpretation, right? This is a modern illustration style, which is perfectly fine depending on the style that you're replicating. So there we go. So we're gonna do that. Uh, we're gonna turn off the background so that I can see my cityscape. And now you're gonna notice that this little piece of mountain is in front of the cityscape. I've got a couple of things going on here. First is I have the silhouette of the buildings in the background. And then I have the solid color buildings. And this is all really sharp pen tools. So this won't take me long at all. So I'm going to make sure that I've created a swatch for that uh, blue, which I haven't yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and toggle that, drag it and drop it over. So you'll notice the three colors I've added to my swatch library so far. And then I'm gonna go in with my eyedropper. I'm gonna sample this background color. I'm gonna make that a swatch while I'm at it. So you can see I'm up to four colors here, uh, the rose color, the yellow moon, the blue of the trees and kind of this uh, I don't know, uh, beige kind of yellowy beige color for the silhouette. Then you'll notice that the front cityscape has a color. So I'm gonna drag that over. I'm just sampling it directly from there. And the windows are the last color. The windows and the yellow area, the dune is really close in color, but we'll go ahead. Uh, I'm working with the uh, silhouette color here. So I'm gonna toggle that. Now I'm just gonna use the pen tool. And just like I did with the tree, I'm drawing straight lines. And I'm not only drawing straight lines, I'm overlapping my shapes with the shapes that are gonna be in front of it, right? So you can see what I'm doing here. I'm creating a shape that is bigger than the shape I'm creating in my cover. I'm creating an overlap. The reason I'm creating the overlap is so that I can build elements in front, right? I don't have to be so exact with my drawing because this shape is in front of the other shape. And so I'm creating this and I'm gonna create straight lines. And so there is my uh, silhouette background. And then I'm gonna use my eyedropper, sample that color. I'm gonna use my pen tool again and again, I'm gonna create the shapes of the buildings and you can see what I'm doing. The shape is actually, it looks really weird when it's an outline, but it's an important part of the process because you gotta see things in overlap. You gotta see things in solid shapes. You gotta kind of see things like this. So you get comfortable with kind of the visual aspect of what we're drawing. And so, and you're noticing the overlap, I'm creating overlaps for the dunes. And so now you can see it looks kind of weird because let me hide the, let me hide the image layer. And you can really see what's going on here. Like I've got these weird silhouettes. They're all outlined right now. You don't see the windows, you see these weird mountains, but trust me in the end, this thing is gonna make a lot of sense because we're able to add to then subtract. Okay, so last but not least, I'm gonna go into my swatches library. Uh, I need to uh, get the window color. And then this is literally a rectangular shape just for the windows. So I'm just gonna go in here and create little windows. And I could do shift copy because it looks like they're in perfect rows to create this perfect row. So we do have smart guides, but I could get in here. Let me zoom in a little bit. Just for the sake of my kind of OCD type A personality, I'm going to do shift option and make copies of this thing. And I'm gonna drag them across to make sure that they are perfect lot copies. 
let me get rid of these and I'm gonna make perfect copies of these too. Just so it's just shift option. And you're gonna notice when we do the leaves for the tree, it's the same exact process of creating a leaf and replicating it over and over again, which is all this artist did. So you'll start to see the ability to create patterns and patterns are really important because that's what creates kind of a complex design from something not so complex. And so I'm in here just creating my basic window here. All right, so let's zoom out. All right, so we've got our mountain. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna switch the color of this and I'm gonna right click on it and bring it to front so that I can create these scenes so you can see what it looks like. I'm gonna turn off, I'm gonna turn off my background image so you can really start to see it, right? Here's my city now, background to foreground. I'm just constructing this thing. Watch if I toggle the tree and I turn on my background, you really get an idea for what I've created so far. But you'll also notice there's weird overlaps. Things are hiding underneath, things are hiding in front of. That's perfectly fine because I'm creating this thing like cut paper so that I'm kind of creating things as I need to based on background, middle ground and foreground. So let me zoom in. All right, we got this thing going. So now I got to hit the toggle switch and I've got to change that tree back to outline. And the reason I'm doing that is because I've got to cut the shapes out of the tree. I'm going to do that before I create the leaves because the leaves are one shape just replicated over and over and over again. Uh, so let's zoom in and take a look at this tree. And you're going to notice that this tree has these little jagged cutouts. When the artist did this, it, they did it as a solid trunk. And then they came in and cut out negative space out of the shape. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my pen tool and I'm going to create these jagged shapes that the tree has cut out of it. So there's my first one. I'm just going to do that. So here's my shape. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down shift and select that shape and the tree. So you see the shape in the tree. And I'm going to go into my Pathfinder tool and I'm going to subtract this cutout from the tree. So I'm going to hit the subtract. And now you're going to notice that shape is cut out, right? So now if I did my toggle, you can see the moon behind it, right? So that's all this artist did. They started with solid shapes and then they cut these interesting shapes out of the solid shapes. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to create the next jagged shape. Remember, I can overlap it because the only place that it matters is where this thing touches the tree. So I'm gonna click on that. I'm gonna click on the tree by holding down shift and I'm gonna subtract the next shape. So now you can really see if I hit the little toggle switch, the cutout of this thing, right? So now I have these two pieces cut out from the tree. Now I've got another piece kind of coming in here. So I'm gonna use my pen tool. I'm gonna to create my next little shape. And I do this all the time when I'm creating logos, create complex shapes and then cut shapes out of the complex shape. The play of positive and negative space is really important in a design. And so now I'm gonna take the next one, I'm gonna create my shape and I'm gonna create it right about where the trunk is just to give me kind of an interesting cut out there. And so I'll use my selection tool, I'll select the shape and the tree, and then I'll subtract that shape. Now you'll notice that this branch is disjointed from this branch, but when I select the tree, it's still one compound, what they call compound path. This tree is separate in shape from this tree now because I cut it out, but it's technically what's called a compound path, which means that the tree is still one shape. It's just broken into pieces. And that's really important to understand because that's how typography works. When you outline type, it's a complex compound path, but it's all one shape technically. That's what Illustrator thinks. Illustrator thinks it's all one shape, right? So when I click on this thing, it is this object compound path make. So this is one complex shape now. Tree, branch, 
tree trunk. So when you start breaking this thing up into multiple pieces, it's good to make sure that it's compound path. The compound path is important because it allows you then to cut more shapes out. Once you separate that thing into pieces like you would typography, you wanna make sure you do object compound path make just to make sure that this thing stays one whole thing as you start cutting it up into a million different pieces. Where that matters, you got a person, you're cutting arms that, were, that seem disjointed from the body or you have an illustration where a, some object is cut into multiple pieces using the Pathfinder tool, but they're individual pieces, but they're all part of one greater thing. It's called a compound path. So you just want to make sure that your object is a compound path. And you can select that shape and double check it under object compound path make, which is right down here. And then you can always double check to make sure that your shape is still a unified shape, even as you start to subtract it. And now you can see if I hit my toggle switch, I go back into my layers. I'm going to turn on the background, but turn off the image. And now look what I have so far. Oh man, things are really coming along here, right? I got my tree cut up into its pieces. I have that yellow moon back there. I have the cityscape, the little piece of land. Everything is doing well. So I'm gonna go ahead and hide that background again. Uh, you'll notice that I need to, now that I created this complex shape, I need to send it to back on my middle ground layer so that the city is in front of it. So you see the cityscapes back in front of it, but the uh, this little piece of mountain is, so technically on the middle ground, this little piece of mountain is foreground, the cityscape is middle ground, and the tree and leaves are background, all within the middle ground layer. So it can get kind of that babushka style, like really complicated in its stacking because you've got layers inside of layers. You have an order structure inside of an order structure. I have to say some, illustration style like this, I've had designers before use cut paper. I mean, they literally use an X-Acto blade, use cut paper, lay it out and scan it in. I mean, there's just so many different ways to do illustration. So just keep that in mind as you're playing around and you're exploring this illustration. There's lots of different ways to do it. Okay. So I've got to move over to my leaves and you're going to notice that these leaves are the exact same leaf replicate it over and over again. So I'm just gonna use my eyedropper, make sure I have the right color. Looks like the same color as the moon. And I'm gonna draw one leaf. And this is a pretty easy leaf to draw. So you just kind of create a curve there. And here's my leaf. And then I'm gonna copy and paste it. And this is literally just replicating this tree over and over and over again, the leaves. And so this is the part of the patience part of the process because this is literally, so every time I paste, I'm pasting two leaves. And so I'm just gonna rotate this and I'm just gonna quickly copy and paste, copy and paste and just start replicating my leaves over and over again. Every once in a while, I'm going to hide my image background so you can see what it looks like. So if I hide that, those are all the leaves I have so far, right? So if I turn the drawing of the background color, you can really see what's going on here. And so now I've got to just, and I'm going to create the first branch of leaves. And then I'm going to repl replicate all of those leaves and see if I can't match them up to the uh, next branch. Because it looks like the artist used a very similar leaf pattern almost with every single branch. So once you replicate the first bunch of leaves, all they did was group it and copy it to kind of get it in its kind of final resting place. So the thing about design is, and it's something you learn very early on, is that time is money. Like time is money. And you're never working on just one client's project. I mean, I teach full time, have a design business, and I currently have four projects going on, all of which I'm juggling on top of teaching design and just creating things. I mean, uh, you're, you never have one client. I don't care if you have your own business or you're working for an agency or you're working in corporate America, you are gonna have more than one thing going on at a time. So I'm just gonna select these so I can see if I can replicate these. Oh, I'm missing a leaf. 
I'm going to do command G and group that. And then I got to copy this leaf one more time. It looks like I can move it over here. All right. So now I have that and that. I'm going to group it, command G. And I'm going to see if this is the exact same cluster or close to it, just placed over here. Nope, not lucky enough. So let's ungroup. I have to ungroup twice because I grouped it twice. I thought this would buy me some time, but it looks like I'm still going to have to, I made a copy of the leaves. So at least that saved me a little bit of time, right? I have them copied. I just now have to place them all. Maybe the left side of the tree is the same as the right side of the tree. We can only hope, right? Because I'm replicating this thing. I'm taking the time to do this in the lecture because I just want you to see my creative process, right? I get $175 an hour and you're seeing exactly how long it's taking me to replicate elements that someone created, right? This is no different than anybody else. I'm just using the tools as I have used them for the last 25 plus years. No different than you. It's just practice and thinking about and constructing you know, the process of creating something. So, and I'm quicker when it's my idea versus the lecture where I'm creating something that has already been created. I'm deconstructing to reconstruct. And I do that because it's the very easiest way to teach design is to teach scale and proportion and teach you the appropriate way to problem solve as you create things because sometimes you just have to see what good design is. You have to understand what good design looks like. So when you're creating something, your eye already sees this is good or this isn't good. You know, just letting you run free with your thoughts does not mean that you're gonna create something that is good, is effective, can be considered good design, right? You might think in your eye, man, this thing looks great. And I look at it and think it's disjointed. The message isn't coming across. You're not creating what you think you created. You're creating a bit of a mess because visually it doesn't work. Yes, design is subjective, but it's subjective within reason. So I'm just talking you through the process here of different ways to illustrate, just so you get an idea of kind of how the process works, right? You're gonna have some creative director over their, your shoulder, he or she, and they're tapping their foot because they want you to get something done. And the process takes time, right? Time is money, but the process takes time. And as you break things apart and you problem solve, it does get easier for you, but you wanna start understanding the process so that when you have to do it for a series of clients that you have like the appropriate way to construct or deconstruct or the, you could spend more time spinning your wheels on the problem solving part of the process if you don't think at first the appropriate way to render something or create something or the, you know, you spend 80% of your time, 90% of your time just thinking right? What do I want to do? How do I want it to look? What do I want to construct? And so here we go. And so I'm going to zoom out a little bit and I'm going to turn off this, turn on my background. And now you can really see what's going on. Gosh, I would have created these leaves a million times faster if I was drawing them myself instead of copying somebody else's. So I'm going to hide this. And I think I'm going to just, well, there's no good way to replicate this thing a million times over because every time I copy and paste multiple leaves, the pattern is so off that I end up just replicating more leaves. So I'm gonna take my time here and generate a few, but I'm not gonna do all of them because there's some other elements of this illustration I need you to see. So I'll create these last little branches here so we can talk through the process. And then, uh, and then just ignore the fact that it's missing a few leaves because I didn't render every leaf that was on this tree because my hour to hour and a half lecture would turn into two and a half hours. And I don't want that to happen because you need to practice. The thing about digital illustration is learning the appropriate process and practicing. I can show you a million different ways to illustrate. I can teach you the 
pen tool. I can teach you the drawing tools. I can teach you how Adobe analyzes digital illustration, but a lot of it comes down to creating your personality and what you do based on the level of comfort you have in each of the tools inside of the application. So it's kind of the nature of the beast. Everybody kind of does things a little bit differently. You can teach a person to drive, but everybody drives a little bit differently. I mean, it's just the nature of the beast. All right, so we've got at least most of the tree created here. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn that on so you can see what it looks like. I'm not gonna replicate the rest because I need to get to this. I need to get to the sand dunes, that sort of thing. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about smoothing out, about effects, about creating things inside Illustrator using some of the enhanced Photoshop uh, elements and different things like that. Remembering that this is scalable vector graphics, all this stuff is scalable, right? So it's important to understand that even when you're creating a vector solution, it is scalable, right? It's a scalable vector graphic. Okay, so this is what we got so far. Uh, next for me, I'm gonna go ahead and add a new layer and I'm gonna name it foreground dunes. And I'm only naming it background, middle ground and foreground as layers because it's a teaching opportunity. I would name this dunes for the layer and my middle ground, I would name tree and my background, I would, use, I would name yellow moon as the layer. I don't need to know that it's background, middle ground and foreground for me because that's how I construct my elements based on what we're creating. But for you, I think it's important that you see the construct of it. So I'm gonna hide the middle ground now because I need to do the dunes, right? The dunes are my next shape. And you'll notice that yellow is the primary dune and then this kind of burgundy color. I'm not gonna trace all of these little tiny shapes in the dunes. I'm gonna make this dune one big silhouette. So just know that I am not going to cut this thing out. So I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna curve the line and then I'm gonna go up here. I'm gonna curve this a little bit and I'm gonna to touch to here and then I'm gonna go into my next curve and I'm gonna go down here. So you're gonna notice that I am not cutting out the yellow around the shadow. That would make no sense. The dune is actually this, right? The only difference is it has a shadow. So you see that it has a shadow, but it's really this with a shadow cut out of it. So you gotta kind of visualize that. So when I zoom in now to add my shadows, it is this with the shadow. Now I'm gonna turn this back on. I'm gonna switch this to an outline because I think I want to smooth this out a little bit. So I'm gonna go into my properties and you see this little smooth tool. I'm gonna to click on this and see if it'll help me flatten it out a little bit. Let's see if any of these aren't perfectly smooth. Oh, they're actually pretty good. It's not really telling me, ah, that's a little bit better. Uh, I'll go in there and just kind of round this out a little bit. It thinks I did a pretty good job with the pen tool minus this little hiccup right here. So uh, I'll take that as a win. I'm gonna move this down a little bit. I'm gonna curve this a little bit. There we go. I'm given my own shape, but I wanna kind of keep it as smooth as I can. Uh, so that's a really great little uh, aspect of the direct select, right? This direct, direct select tool. These are the properties of that node right here based on your direct select of your point. And if you ever remove the forward directional anchor and continue the line, if you select the node where you remove the forward directional anchor and click this little smoothing, it'll actually flatten it out for you. It'll make it nice and smooth. Okay, uh, so now I have that. Uh, I'm going to go into my layers, I'm going to go into my foreground, and I'm actually going to lock that sand dune path. And the reason I'm locking the sand dune path is because I want to be able to draw my shadow without it interacting with my yellow shape. So I'm going to create this, and you're going to see what I do. So I'm creating the first shape only, right? Creating first shape only of the shadow. Now, I don't have to be perfect right here because it's the shadow and I don't want to see the yellow. So I can make this dune shadow a little bit different. So there it is. So now watch when I unlock this and I toggle the color 
now you can see the shadow in the dune, right? Here it is, shadow and dune. I'm gonna go ahead and lock that again because I wanna create my next shape. And now you can see that I'm visualizing this thing a little bit more like cut paper, a little bit more like cut paper because I want my shapes to stack. And so I'm just gonna do a free forming shadow, just kind of curve mine a little bit different than theirs. So it's not an exact replica of what they're doing. And so I'm just gonna curve this thing, use my space bar so I can move my mouse, curve that. That's good enough. Go back to here, use my space bar, go to there. And so now I'm just gonna kind of curve my shape and you're gonna notice here, I'm gonna go ahead and minimize that one so I can make it a straight line. I'm gonna use my eyedropper, I'm gonna sample that. I'm gonna unlock my dune path so that I can toggle it. And so now let me zoom out a little bit so you can see my dunes, right? And now I'm going to turn off the image and turn on the tree in the background. And now you can see mine, right? I'm really starting to replicate background to foreground, but you will notice that this little thing right here, you can see a little of the color behind it. Now I'm gonna show you something. If I, uh, I'm gonna lock this shadow, I'm gonna keep the fill color unlocked. I'm gonna, I don't need to hide my tree, but I will hide this and turn on this because, and let me hide this for just a second. You're gonna notice that this thing stops short of that peak right there in the actual book cover because, turn that on. So now I'm gonna turn my foreground back on. I'm gonna lock my tree and I'm actually gonna go in here now and I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna move this ever so slightly down so that it's underneath the shadow. And I'm gonna zoom in now and I'm gonna unlock that shadow and I'm gonna lock this so that I can use my smart guide. So I'm gonna use my smart guide and I'm gonna to touch it just north of that. And now you can see the dunes and I'm gonna, uh, there's my background. Gosh, you don't even see anything move. Look how perfect my tree is as it relates to the background. Everything is pretty solid there. Uh, I'm gonna lock this. Let's turn off this. Let's turn on that for a minute, just so that you can see the elements I've created. Just using the process. I'm just walking you through the process. Uh, I'm gonna turn off that. I'm gonna turn on my background. I'm gonna turn off my dunes because I need, I need this little dude here or dudette. I don't even know what's going on here, this little person. And so now let me use my eyedropper. Uh, I'm going to, uh, let's sample that blue. And I'm gonna use my pen tool. And we're gonna use Pathfinder tool again, right? I'm just gonna do it really quickly so that you can see what I'm creating. I'm, I'm actually gonna, I think I'm gonna add another layer and just name it a uh, silhouette or person. I could actually name it type two, type slash person. Uh, because that stuff's sitting on top. So let's do that. I'm not gonna do the footprints and everything, but I'm just gonna talk you through the process of the silhouette because this is once again, a pathfinder opportunity. So I'm gonna make it a stroke and not a fill. And I'm just gonna draw this person really quickly. Let's zoom in. Let's just make sure that I get the basic shape. I'm just getting basic. This person's actually a really simple silhouette. The person did. They did not really stress over this much at all. So there's my silhouette. 
And so now I got to cut the arm out. Same process, right? I'm going to create a small shape so that you can see it. I'm going to create a small shape. I'm going to select this small shape. I'm going to select the silhouette outline and I'm going to subtract that shape. So now if I toggle it, you can see there's a hole cut out of it, right? There's a hole cut out of it. So the last thing I got to do is the little space down here. And so we're going to go across. And your book has you practicing these in their little mini projects. I'm just talking you through the process. So let's take this, hold down shift, take that and subtract again. You'll notice that the first subtraction did not disjoint the shape, did not create two separate shapes. If it did, I would have to go to object, compound path, make, so that we would reunify that. Once you split a shape in half, cut it into two separate shapes, you got to make a compound path. And that way you can keep cutting shapes out. All right, so here's my little dude or dudette. There they are. I'm not going to do the little footprints or anything. You get the idea as that part of the process goes. And so now let's zoom out. Let's see what we got. I'm going to go back to my layers. I'm going to turn all my layers on, but I'm going to turn off my background. And here is my illustration. Totally vectorized created in a background, middle ground, and foreground, using the pen tool, using the Pathfinder tool, using the smooth tool, using all the basic elements of pen overlap to create kind of a modern interpretation or modern style. So we're getting there, we're plugging along. So now that we have it created, I'm gonna now go in, I wanna talk a little bit about some different techniques that could have been applied. So I'm gonna name a new layer and I'm just gonna call it techniques. Cause I wanna talk a, a little bit and I'm actually just gonna lock all these other layers so you can see uh, what's going on. All right, so this is my new techniques layer. Now, if I was drawing this tree, uh, I would have probably, if I was doing it for myself, I would have probably drawn a trunk. So watch what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna draw a trunk just like you know, probably you guys would do, right? Here's a trunk. And I would take the pen tool and I would create a branch. So here's my branch. And I would change that branch to a stroke. And once I changed it to a stroke, I would make it a little thicker. So here's my branch, right? And last week we talked about the round cap. So I'm gonna round it off. So here it is. You can see my branch round, round it off and kind of tapered in the way I would want it to be tapered. Now. Once I had it about the general thickness of the smallest part of the branch, I would go in with the width tool and I would go in here and I would expand the thickness of this branch and make it thicker where it attaches to the tree and thinner where it's by the base. And so now you can see this thing has a thick and thin attribute to it. I don't know if you've ever used that before the width tool, but now I could go in here and make it thinner at the end. I mean, I literally can change the thickness and make it its own organic thing. The reason that's important. Well, this is a little bit more, it looks like cut paper style of thing, but watch what happens if I create with the width tool and I go to object expand appearance. Object expand appearance makes this a shape. It is no longer a line with a thick and thin. Well, once it's that I can, grab those two things and I could make it one shape. And so now I can do that again. So I'm gonna use my pen tool. I'm gonna to click on this branch and we got another little branch going on here. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna switch it to there. I'm gonna change the stroke, beef it up a little bit. I'm gonna zoom in so you can see what's going on. Zoom in and I'm gonna select this. I'm gonna use the width tool. I'm gonna to make it a little thicker at the end a little tapered at the end like that. And so now you can see my branch. I'm gonna do object expand appearance, which makes it a shape, not a stroke. Once I have that, I can select these two things. I can go into the Pathfinder tool and I can unite them. Now, if I didn't do that, watch what I can do. Now that I have this as a shape, I can use this shape like to create whatever I want. So you see, I could do that. 
uh, oh, copy and paste, uh, object transform reflect, flip it to the other side. And I can create a drawing that looks totally unique and organic. So you can see what's going on here. I can start to really get a funky tree here. Uh, unite those two things, unite these two things. And now I'm creating my own tree using the WISP tool and using the pen tool. So this one, I do such a great job. I should have tapered that a little bit at the end, but you can really start to see the organic quality of this tree by using the WISP tool. And I do that also for things like, uh, let's zoom in here. If I was cutting out this, I used to do this, create actual shapes like that and subtract, right? That's how I used to draw. Everything I did was like that. Now I've started to create more organic, kind of modern fluid shapes. So watch what happens. Uh, go here, bump up my stroke weight a little bit, go into my whisk tool, and I'm gonna make it thicker like that. Now I didn't round it all. So you see that it has an end cap. So watch what happens when I move it in here. I do object expand appearance, which makes this a shape. It's no longer a stroke. Get in here, Pathfinder tool and subtract it. And look at the butt flat edge of that. That is way easier to do than drawing the shape with the pen tool as a shape and then cutting it out. So what if I had to do that again, right? Here, change it to a stroke, leave it as an end cap, add a little thickness to the stroke, change the width, Now, if I wanted to like, so let's do this object expand. If I wanted to look at it before I cut it out, I could just eyedropper the pasteboard and now I can see what it would look like based on where I put it. Maybe I want it there. This tree would be way easier to create using the width tool, expand appearance and create this organic effect of this tree versus me pen tool going around every single branch here. I would just create a shape, replicate it, squish it, expand it, attach it, make it all one silhouette, and then cut it out with the width tool, draw a line, make my pie shapes and subtract them. A way easier process using that technique. If you haven't used the width tool, you should be practicing this a little bit because it's a really easy way to create a tapered shape, very modern, very simple tapered shape. I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna make the end cap rounded. That brings life to your design like never before. I mean, it's, it's like an airbrush. I mean, it's so smooth in its taper and you can go into any part of the line and do whatever you want. You can squish it in and then here I could expand it back out. I mean, you can create some beautiful line work, expand the appearance. And the beauty about expanding the appearance is you could then go in and depending on what you're doing, go in here, add a color, boost up the stroke weight, add it to the outside of the shape, and you can start creating some really graphic things. So you should be practicing the width tool a little bit this week because it makes life a lot easier. So once I have something created, so let's say, so let's go in here now. And just for the sake of the process, I'm gonna unlock everything except for the background image. And I'm gonna grab the tree in the mountains. The reason I'm grabbing the tree in the mountains, I'm gonna do a copy. I'm gonna lock every layer, but my techniques layer, and I'm gonna piece the tree over here. And I'm pasting the tree over here so that you can see this thing in all of its glory. Actually, it looks kind of nice over here on the pasteboard. Uh, out from the drawing. And so I'm going to highlight this and I'm going to group it. So I have the tree and the leaves grouped because now we can start talking about effects, right? The pen tool, the pathfinder tool, subtracting, adding, unifying, using the whisk tool to create shapes, to cut out things, to add to things, all part of just the technique of drawing. But once you get into the effects palette, take a look at the different kinds of effects. Now, if you're drawing shapes for your projects in your book, you should be creating a few, as you're creating them, 
make a copy of things that you're creating and put them in the pasteboard. And first off, play with the illustrator effects. And the reason the illustrator effects are important is because the effect you create can be expanded and makes it its own kind of uniquely new object. And by that, I mean, I can create a bulge, an arc, uh, uh, some kind of like scalable effect, illustrator effect that I then can expand and make unique. So like you're drawing a bird like we did last week, but you want that bird to have a little more personality. So you wanna give it like a bulge. So like the chest is kind of bulging out in the illustration. You can actually go into the warp palette and effects and you're gonna see bulge. And watch what happens when I create a horizontal versus a vertical bulge. Look at the way this thing changes itself. So the blue line is the original illustration, right? So look at how I'm kind of squishing this thing out. It's bigger in the middle and it curves out in the back. Look at the shape of this thing. So let's say I really love this, right? I drew the original thing. It was very flat, very two-dimensional, but I wanted to create an arc or I wanted to create a, a, a flag shape. I wanted to create kind of this fish taper where it's going from background to foreground, or maybe I want it to rise a little bit. Now I'm doing it in a drastic percentage, 41%. So you can really see what's going on versus inflate, versus squeeze, all techniques to take what you did and kind of give it three-dimensional purpose in a two-dimensional space. So I'm gonna go back to arch because I just want you to see the difference. Now look at the original blue and look at how this thing is curving now and starting to have three-dimensional purpose in a two-dimensional space. Why are illustrator effects important? I'm gonna go ahead and click okay. Look at how this looks compared to that. You see how this thing now looks like the tree is behind the front of this shape I drew. It actually looks like it's going back in space. It's not as flat as this. It now has three-dimensional purpose. Well, that's really cool because I created this thing. But if I share this file and it's Illustrator and the person who is sharing, I'm sharing it with doesn't have Illustrator, they're not going to see this effect as seamlessly and smooth as I did because I used an Illustrator effect. But watch what happens. I'm going to go ahead and select this tree and this mountain. You see how the blue highlights the original shape? but the shape is actually now bulging and going back in the distance. Watch what happens when I expand appearance, objects expand appearance. You're gonna watch that blue line go away. So watch what happens. That is now the new norm. So look at the difference. I actually like this better. Look at how this thing looks like it's going back and that the blue front area of the blue is to the forward. It's like it's tilting into three dimensional space. This has much more personality, I think, than the flatness of this. Well, I can tell you, you can draw anything in Illustrator and add an Illustrator effect to it, and you can literally make it something new. There's so many times I draw birds, butterflies, people, buildings, and I use the Illustrator effects of stylizing something or warping something, and it gives it a whole new personality. And once you expand the appearance of that effect, the effect disappears from the properties window, which means the only thing Illustrator understands is that this was drawn in Illustrator and this is what it looked like when you drew it. It immediately takes away the Illustrator effect and makes it its own new unique shape. So that's a really awesome way to create something and then make it, it your own. It works perfectly with logo design, spot illustration, pictographs, if you're creating something and you make it very flat, because that's how you see it, let's say you draw a fish, but then you go in and you use the warp tool that's called fish and taper that thing from thick to thin, it'll take the goldfish style of fish silhouette, the really flat cutout, and it will give it three-dimensional purpose in a two-dimensional space. And if you expand the appearance after you do that, you will get a really beautiful dimensional illustration inside a flat world in essence. So kind of think of it like, uh, is it Stanley, flat Stanley that little kids cut out and they're in like elementary school and then you're supposed to mail Stanley off and he's supposed to go on an adventure and then you're supposed to share Stanley with family members and they're supposed to take pictures of themselves with Stanley. Well, Stanley's a flat illustration, but when you take him out and you tilt him a little bit or you lean him forward or back and you take a photo, all of a sudden Stanley has a little perspective right? He doesn't look so flat. Well, 
the illustrator effects are a really great way to create dimen scalable dimensional space, which means this thing can be exported as an SVG or scalable vector graphic or copied in as a smart object in Photoshop and it is fully scalable. Now, that is different than this little fun series of effects below it, which are called Photoshop effects. Now, if you know anything about Illustrator versus Photoshop, Photoshop effects are raster based. And the reason I say that is because students fall in love with iPad apps that are photo based, which means they have airbrush tools built into their applications. And I'll have to name any of the famous ones because there's a bunch of them out there. And I'm sure if you've ever drawn with an iPad, you've downloaded one of them. But those are not scalable. They are Photoshop effects, airbrushes, textures, distortions, blurs, anything that is pixel based in a vector environment is not scalable. The only way it can become scalable is if you trace that image, which is object image trace. Now, once you image trace it, it makes it thousands of little itty bitty shapes. So if you blurred something and you image trace it, that thing then becomes a bunch of little shapes. So I'm gonna show you how that works. So now if I copy this really cool perspective, this is my tree perspective. And so I'm gonna move it and I'm gonna drop it just over the top of the other tree. And I'm gonna go into my effects and I'm gonna add a blur to my tree. I'm gonna crank this thing up. And so now that is a copy of my other tree, but I applied a blur to the copy and look what that looks like. This is a Photoshop blur behind the silhouette illustrator warp effect. This is scalable. This is not. The blur is not, but look at the effect. It's beautiful. Look at that three-dimensional space, right? Man. So let's, let's just see what it looks like. Let's see what the personality of it is if I do that. So I'm going to take the background. I'm going to copy and paste it over. I'm going to move it over here so we have a copy of it. And then I'm going to take my new tree and I'm going to do it so you can see the difference. Look at the difference of this illustration and this illustration. Here is cut paper flat, no perspective, no illustrator effects, no Photoshop effects, literally cut paper. And look at this illustrator effect combined with Photoshop effect combined with cut paper or simple shapes. Wow, what a difference. And look at this blur. So now if I select the blur layer, you're gonna notice in the properties menu, I can adjust the blur anytime I want to. So let's say that blur is too much. I'm gonna click on the effect and I'm gonna shrink it down. So now look at it. So let me nudge this a little bit so you can just see the difference. Now, let's take it, one, look how harsh it is now. I made the blur really tight, so the shadow is really harsh, but I can change the opacity of that too. I mean, the sky is the limit now. When you start to, ooh, so much better. So I made the blur 64% opacity, and look now, it's not as busy. It looks like a nice shadow. And man, look at that. I love that. So if that's the effect I was going for, this thing is really coming along. It is now a three-dimensional illustration in a two-dimensional space. So not only did I cre create background, middle ground, and foreground, and in each one of those layers, I created background, middle ground, and foreground inside each layer. And now I added Illustrator effects and Photoshop effects to the elements separated in each layer. Now I can create a lot of personality, right? I can create a lot of personality. Maybe I'm going for three, three dimensional space in a two dimensional plane. Like maybe that's what I'm going for, but take a look at the Pathfinder tool and how the shadow tucks in behind it and it bleeds behind it and it overlaps. I mean, this is just a really beautiful way to illustrate if you visually can see it and are comfortable with it. Sometimes I'll do things like 
only blur the leaves, make them a separate object, a separate grouped object, then the tree, and then it looks like the, the leaves are blurring, but the tree is still. So now you start pushing your brain beyond the basic understanding of illustration, background, middle ground, and foreground, illustrator effects versus Photoshop effects, with tool to create with expand appearance, and you're starting to really make a much more dynamic construct. You're starting to really see things in a much more dynamic way. It's a really good way of illustrating now that we've taken it beyond basic pen tool. Now, Last but not least, if I create a effect in Illustrator, right? A Photoshop effect. The problem is that isn't scalable. So if I share an EPS file, I copy this out and paste it into Photoshop as a smart object. It's gonna become distorted as I play around with it. This thing is a raster-based effect inside a vector-based application. And it's the same thing I do with my students if they draw something on their iPad and all of a sudden they fall in love with smudges and blurs and airbrushes and all these things that make things look cool and have detail and, you know, airbrush the makeup on the illustration I'm drawing of the person and uh, blur out their hands so it looks like they're throwing a baseball, right? All these things you can love in other applications. This thing is a problem because it is a blur. It is a Photoshop experience. So watch what happens when I expand the appearance. You're gonna notice that a big box now goes over the top of this thing, creating in essence, a frozen group. It's now frozen. But now in the property window, you're, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but you can actually image trace even a Photoshop effect. So you'll notice the first thing I did was expand this thing, kind of lock it in its place. And then I'm gonna click on image trace and I'm gonna trace this thing in high fidelity photo. And it's gonna tell me this thing is gonna take a while because I chose to trace it in high fidelity, it's gonna take a while. So let's give it a second and take a look at what happens. This was a Photoshop effect, remember? So now I'm tracing it in image trace is high fidelity, which means like high quality trace. It's breaking it into all of its colors. Curve the fitting, trace every shape, tick, 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 tick. Oh, look what happened. It created a box around it. So watch what happens now. Expand the trace. Now, this thing, look at what it's done it's created a shadow with an outline. So look at this thing. Each one of these shapes is a shape. Look how many there are, right? This thing is broken up into a million shapes now. So I'm gonna undo that. Let's undo this big old trace going on here. All right, so there it is. So now it's back in its simple expand appearance. By expand appearance, it means it has removed the shadow effect, Photoshop effect from the object and made it a grouped compound path in essence. Now I can use this thing, share it with people, copy it as a smart object into Photoshop, and it will maintain its raster qualities in a scalable environment based on what the pixel ratio is of the image at the time I expanded it. So now it's kind of frozen in its pixel density. So that would bring us to the last question of the process. When I'm creating something that has Illustrator and Photoshop effects, I will draw it at its final output, not smaller, its final output. So if I'm creating a poster in InDesign and I need to draw an illustration, but I want in the illustration that Photoshop effects, I will draw my document or artboard size to whatever the final output size is for the magazine or the newspaper or the 
uh, web template I'm creating so that when I embed this thing inside InDesign for my layout, I copy and paste it as a smart object into Photoshop for a magazine cover I'm creating or a poster or whatever book cover, that thing is purely crisp at its final output. So remember, Illustrator, you can fall in love with like stamp size drawings, but you want to make sure that the elements you create, if you're introducing Photoshop effects with the Illustrator effects, that you're drawing at 100% output. It doesn't matter if it's Illustrator or Illustrator effects because that thing's completely scalable, right? You can blow that thing up. You can do whatever you want with it. But if you're introducing raster-based effects into Illustrator, you need to make sure that you expand the appearance or freeze the effect. It will remove the effect from the object and it will make it, in essence, an Illustrator-esque object inside of Illustrator. Now, that can create a whole bunch new tools and tricks for you. So hour and 30 minutes or so for the lecture. I did a good job this week sticking with the process. So let's take a quick peek at uh, today's deliverables just so that you get an idea of what we're working on. Uh, like I said, I'm actually leaving at five o'clock in the morning to go to New York City in the morning to go to the College Art Association. So let's take a quick peek uh, to see what you're working on while I'm gone for a couple of days. So let's go into our modules. Now, you have for learning module two, chapter three and four. Like I said, chapter three has about seven mini projects inside of it. You can pick any of the mini projects and submit them for me, but please make sure you practice each of the mini projects because it is teaching you what we did tonight in lecture and all little micro steps. So you only have to give me one of the four, five, six, seven. There's a bunch of them in there, little mini projects. But do make sure that you practice each one of them. Four isn't as bad. Four only has a couple of projects. You can also pick that as well. But your out of book project is to illustrate a book cover. And there are some beautiful ones. This is the one that I picked to do with the class, right? There's some beautiful ones. But so what you have to do is an eight by 10 illustrator file uh, a book cover of your choice. I don't know if you're reading anything right now uh, that you might be interested in making an illustration out of. I'm kind of on a Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln kick right now. So I'm reading the latest one of those books that I found, um, which is interesting. I like history. So, but I didn't want to do Abraham Lincoln because that would be kind of a weird illustration to do as our lecture tonight. Um, but you can pick any book cover that you would like. Please make sure all the elements are in there. Please make sure that you have the name of it, the author, the book cover illustrated. It needs to be all original illustrations that you created in Illustrator. And I would like you to use some Illustrator effects. I would like you to use the Pathfinder tool. <laughs> I would like you to use the things that you're practicing in chapter three and four, and let's see what kind of illustration you come up with. A PDF is fine as your final output, it's eight by 10. 300 DPI, but remember it's scalable. So as long as you save it as an Illustrator PDF for me, I can scale it to any size I want, but make your canvas or your artboard uh, eight by 10. And you can do uh, a loose sketch like we did week one. You can do a more graphic style like we did week two. I'm looking to see you start to kind of evolve your illustration style and let's see what you can come up with. And I look forward to seeing it. Remember a PDF, no illustration files. So everybody have a good Valentine's Day. Have a good night. Have a good week. Uh, I'll be back Friday uh, late afternoon. So I'll be in the class nosing around over the weekend if you're submitting something. Uh, and then we'll hit the ground running again on Thursday with our next couple of illustrator uh, skills. Remember, practice, practice, practice. If you spend a little time practicing, you're going to get so much better and your confidence for illustrating is going to get so much higher and you really might fall in love with digital illustration. So I look forward to seeing your projects. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and the share.